concern you about the un unknown and the unidentified flying object? Oh, yes. We discussed it at every conference that we had with the military, and they never had been, never were able to make me a concrete report on it. Do you have anything on the subject, sir? No, I haven't, I haven't anything on the subject. And they, they, there's always things like that going on. The flying saucers and we've had other things, you know. For years, the world has seen reality distorted. Facts manipulated. And truth hidden. But there's even more to the story than anyone has ever suspected. Because no one has been able to see the whole picture. Until now. G'day and welcome back to another episode of the Unexplained Rundown. I'm your host, Grant Levac, and if you found this channel intentionally, then like me, you're intrigued by the unexplained mysteries of this mortal coil of ours, and you crave to know what's real and what's not. Now, today I've got the privilege and pleasure of talking with three gents that I've long respected and have had the good fortune of learning from directly. Joining me today is Bill Chalker, a veteran Australian UFO UAP researcher and author of The Oz Files, the Australian UFO story. Uh, Bill has a great online blog that goes by the same name, The Oz Files. If you haven't had a chance to check it out, do so. Links are in the description below. A uh, ton of great information, wealth of info on UAP and UFOs in an Australian context. I'm also joined by Ross Coulthard, a multi-award-winning investigative journalist with over three decades of experience uh, in newspapers and television, including reporting for the Sydney Morning Herald newspaper, ABC TV Four Corners, uh, the Nine Network Sunday program, 60 Minutes, Seven Network Sunday Night, and more recently, Seven News Spotlight program. You all know his book, In Plain Sight, which is a central reading, and he is the co-host of the always informative Need to Know podcast with his part podcasting partner in crime, Bryce Zabel. And my final guest is Reddit user Harry is White Hot, whose first name is Jeff, but he prefers to go by that Reddit handle uh, due to his line of work. He's had a lifelong interest in UFOs as well as EMP nuclear weapons effects and alternate methods of propulsion for spacecraft. He's worked in signals intelligence from space-based assets for a number of years uh, before he moved into the ONG sector, making rocket fuel. So uh, I hope you enjoy today's episode of the Unexplained Rundown. Uh, so, so Bill Ross and, and Harry uh, is white hot, but we'll go by your first name of, of Jeff. Uh, look, thank you all for taking some time out of your day to uh, have a chat with me. I know this has been long overdue. I appreciate you guys making yourself available for a, a discussion on all things UAP and, and Australia's history uh, on this topic and, and current involvement or rather lack thereof. Uh, so um, many watching this show will obviously be well versed with the uh, the Five Eyes Intelligence Alliance, but what they might not know is that we've all been corresponding um, you know, in a group email chain for well over a year now, and we affectionately refer to ourselves as the uh, as the Five Guys. We're missing the fifth guy, Keith Basterfield, today, so he's not with us. But it's great to have the four of the Five Guys together. Uh, finally, uh, to, to have a good chat. So, so great to be with you, and thanks for thanks for thanks for being with me today. It's a pleasure. All good. So, um, so Bill, I probably I just wanted to, to kick off with you, just as a, as an opener. Um, you know, uh, I might start with you. I have to thank you in part, or as my wife would say, blame you, because um, you're the reason why, or one of the reasons why I got interested in the uh, in the UFO topic. You know, when I was a a little fella in the 80s, my dad took me to my first UFO uh, photo exhibition, which is at the, the Sydney uh, Centrepoint Tower in the mid-80s. Oh, and right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I found yeah, yeah. out in, uh, in our conversations when we first uh, started uh, engaging in discussions that you were actually involved in organising that particular event. So perhaps for folks that aren't familiar with your your background, what's your origin story? What you got briefly what you what got you interested in the in the ufo uap topic oh god yeah, that's going back quite a way um yeah during the mid 60s um uh, particularly 1966 it was a huge year for ufos in australia you had a lot of the classic cases as you know west hall you had the 
Tully case, uh, the Ball and Photo case, the uh, Ben Hanbites case, you know, a large number of really impressive cases. And here was I, a young teenager on the north coast of New South Wales, and uh, local police were uh, busily chasing UFOs. It's become a huge story, uh, international story. In fact, got you picked up in uh, Frank Edwards' book, uh, uh, flying Sources Here and Now, and that was one of the first books that I read, actually, in about 1967, 68. And uh, uh, one of the few people who didn't see UFOs in Grafton appeared to be me. And so it was uh, essentially, uh, I just kind of got um, sort of caught up in, the, I guess, the interest that was going on in the local area on the north coast of New South Wales. I got to know the local newspaper editor, uh, Got access to all of these archives. Started diving into the newspaper archives, and uh, and and so gradually um, started to develop my interest. But it really didn't take off big time in terms of field investigations until 1969, when uh, uh, at a place called Bunga Walburn, north of Grafton, there was a, uh, a story that blew up big time. Uh, once again, another big big story uh, of a so-called flying saucer nest or as a flying source of land here on this property. And the property belonged to the local member of parliament. And that sort of helped the story go national, indeed international. And uh, um, I joined probably, uh, uh, there was probably several hundred people turned up at the location. And I was one of them because uh, my family knew uh, Mr. Ian Robertson, the owner and the member of parliament. And uh, there was a lot going on there. Um, uh, and 1969 was yet another wave here, and, and it was really my, I guess, early uh, moments of uh, getting heavily involved. Yeah, right. there was was a huge, huge kind of wave going on, and there were multiple UFO landing sites being found, or ground trace sites, etc. And uh, and also Harwood Island on the north coast there was also a centre of a lot of close encounter activity as well, including mm -hmm. landing and a witness for a woman or an object hovering above the children's grain crop and beam of light being shone onto and being levitated or felt she was being levitated off the ground. And then uh, that was partially witnessed by others. So that was my essential baptism of fire. And your, by, your the early 70s, I, yeah, by the early 70s, oh. I was at the University of England, had my own UFO group going on at, on campus. And we were, anybody in the New England North Coast area knew there was some mad guy at Earl Page College, <laughs> the University of New England, who was interested in chasing up UFOs. And, and, and by 73, we're, we were locked into a, uh, a, a field investigation of a major UFO wave, very localised, breaking out of Cheringham and Durban. And uh, that was definitely my baptism of UFO fire. We were seeing UFOs yeah. and we were chasing them and trying to photograph them, all that kind of thing. Yeah. And you're still you're still at it all these years and decades later. Yeah, for all my UFO sins, I'm still at it. But, but, uh, <laughs> well, yeah, uh, Ross, I won't I, I won't bore you with the same question, that. but um, I, I've got one that hopefully hasn't been posed to you before. My um, my father has so been a criminal barrister for for decades, and when I first learnt of your humble beginnings as a legal professional, I. Uh, uh, it gave me a whole level, new level of respect for you because I've seen firsthand, I've been in courtrooms, I've seen firsthand how much time, energy and effort goes into completing comprehensive document reviews, interviewing witnesses, preparing uh, witness statements, reviewing them, knowing what questions to ask, not what to ask, when to ask them, uh, protecting sources, all of those, those foundational skills and those disciplines, did that help prepare you for a transition into investigative journalism and and, is, and what was the inspiration for you to, to move down that path away from uh, a legal profession? Um, because I'm a nosy bastard to be honest Grant. <laughs> I, 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 um, I, I did work briefly as a lawyer and um, I think the skills that you acquire when you do a law degree especially the training that I had during my degree are invaluable for quality long-form digging journalism investigative journalism by any other word um, I was taught at a law school in New Zealand where they used what's called the Socratic method. And essentially, it was a form of terror because you would basically be cross-examined before the rest of the class by the lecturer. Uh, and there were 200 other people in the room, aspiring law students. 
And if you failed continuously to do your brief and not be across the case that you were being cross-examined about, if you weren't quick enough to think on your feet, you could get kicked out of law school. And so it was a hell of a learning experience because it made you, certainly made me think very quickly about getting to the essence, to the ratio, the absolute nub of an issue straight away, mm -hmm. being able to analyze vast amounts of information very, very quickly, and then being able to present that in a public way without feeling intimidated or deterred and, and to try and do it accurately. So, yep. yeah, I think it's a great nexus. There's a lot of, a lot of journalists are ex-failed lawyers like me. <laughs> and uh, uh, basically, my big weakness was... Um, uh, when I was working in law, I, I just couldn't keep my mouth shut. You know, you'd be working for clients who were often quite reprehensible. <laughs> I, I, I just couldn't find my, I, I just couldn't find it in myself to be able to do the things that lawyers have to do to uh, protect a client. Yeah, yeah. And um, for, for for you, Harry or, or Jeff, uh, I, I know that there's a story behind your Reddit handle, which we'll we'll get to uh, to later today. But interested to learn what sort of conversations you've been having on, on Reddit and, and what are some of the areas of focus or topics that, uh, that interest you? My main one at the moment, Grant, is uh, the bluegill triple prime um, nuclear test, which it was a very, very odd test in that it failed three times previous. That's why it's got the name triple prime. Um, the rockets failed in space twice and uh, one blew up on the launch pad. So I've only just recently seen, um, was it Colonel Lauren Dietrich come out and say that um, some missiles were taken out in space previously. Um, this sort of connects with that. And it also ties in with what Tom DeLong was saying on uh, Jimmy Church's Trade to Black radio show before he knew his emails had been hacked, where he, he didn't mention Neil McCaslin or John Podesta, but 10 days after that interview where he said uh, they actually shot one down and he says that the Soviets and the Americans were working together to do that. Now, these tests, particularly Bluegill Triple Prime, I believe was a special warhead that used X-rays. It was an enhanced X-ray warhead. Um and initially, I thought it was an EMP effect from the blast, but I've spoken to scientists that were actually there at the time and wrote um, reports that are still restricted data classified. And they said that um, the EMP effect of Bluegill Triple Prime was fairly localised. And funnily enough, um, the guy that ran the science data for Starfish Prime collected all the magnetic data at the time, analysed it, and then stored the um, files, magnetic tape files, in his garage. And then in 2006, someone asked him to run those files again through a modern-day supercomputer, and they found there was a massive diamagnetic bubble produced by Starfish Prime that expelled the magnetic field for up to 16 seconds. So I don't know if you've heard of the unified theory where gravity and electromagnetism are inversely proportional. If that's the case and the magnetic field was expelled for that period of time, it would mean that the gravity field was highly magnified. And I've been looking at this for four or five months and I missed the obvious thing that someone pointed out. One of the Reddit users said that thing fell at a speed of nearly 900,000 miles an hour, which is way more than the 9.8 per second per second acceleration due to gravity. So and this, this was all captured by two separate aircraft filmed in high-speed film. And for the frame of reference, those watching, I'll just uh, just show uh, on on screen. Maybe you can talk briefly to what uh, what was. So this footage was taken by EGNG, and it was it's the only footage remaining that remains sanitized. So I don't know if you wanted to use that as reference. Uh, yeah, that top row there is from the aircraft designated. It was a KC-135. It was heavily instrumented, crewed by EGNG. It was flying at 30,000 feet, and that nuclear blast was at 48 kilometres high. And you could see that top row has got 
a, a large white triangle covering the area where this object appears to fall from. And the, the, the bottom row is actually from another aircraft called Kettle One. And you can mm -hmm. see that um, thing dropping out from within the fireball. And so I, I believe that they were analysed. The top one was analysed by a different lab and the bottom one was was Los Alamos and uh, Lawrence Livermore labs. I'm not sure which did which, but because if, if you've seen the Oppenheimer movie, you'd know that those two labs do not get on at all, and that is well documented. Uh, I think they had different levels of classification uh, ideas, and that's why one got released in its entirety, and this is in 1998 when they came up for review, and the second one had that triangle device placed there. None of the other high altitude shots. There was Checkmate, Kingfish, and Tightrope. Uh, Starfish Prime was too far out because it, it's actually looking at the X ray interaction with the atmosphere. Hmm. Starfish Prime was outside the atmosphere. So, what you're seeing here is uh, the interaction of the X rays with the atmosphere. It makes that glow. None of the other uh, weapon shots are sanitized at all. They, they were yeah. all declassified in 1998. It's only that single one that has a close up interior view of the phenomenology of what's going on in that nuclear blast that has been covered up and you can see on this one here this is the fireball expanding the cameraman actually moves the camera to see what that thing was that fell and mind you 15 seconds in this frame is actually one second of normal time so his reaction time is about three seconds and I'm pretty sure they would have lost money because they con they were contracted to film that fireball and he moves the camera because he's he's saying, what the hell was that? And, and can you think of, before we kind of move on to another topic, can you think of any plausible explanation why that footage remains sanitised to this day? Well, perhaps that object that gets knocked out was... Um, in the process of interfering, like with uh, Robert Jacobson's, what he saw on the Vandenberg shot, mm -hmm. and perhaps it, it detonated before it could do whatever, and it just got whacked out. And and that's exactly what Tom DeLong says. He, he got the name wrong. He called it Starfish Prime, but the date, he said, was the 25th of October, 1962, which is the middle of the Cuban Missile Crisis. The Soviets had detonated one called K3, on the 22nd of October, and that caused the largest EMP effect ever known. Took out massive communications to all throughout Kazakhstan. Yeah, right. So what DeLong was saying, um, that they were working together, um, um, it's plausible. Maybe the Cuban Missile Crisis was a cover in case they decided to shoot back. I'm not sure. But, you know, you, you take these things with a grain of salt at first when you hear them, but then later data comes out that sort of makes it plausible. You go down other rabbit holes. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, well, let's switch gears, Ross. I wanted to um, to switch to you. So uh, we we know, you know you've been saying repeatedly on on Need to Know with your co-host Bryce Abel that uh, many other witnesses are waiting to really see how David Grush has been treated. Uh, which may help inform their decision whether or not to come forward. Where 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 are we currently at? What's what's the latest on David Grush? Okay, uh, well, I've actually just done an interview with Chris Cuomo on News Nation this morning, uh, responding to what we know is coming, which is a hit job story in a magazine online called The Intercept. And um, uh, David, when I first met him on interview with the TV cameras, he very kindly volunteered something very sensitive about his own mental history. He, um, he suffers from PTSD. He, he was a combat veteran in Afghanistan, and he was uh, exposed to all sorts of horrible things during his service, which basically left him very, very traumatized. And so he, um, uh, to his great credit, when I asked him in the interview, uh, is there anything you want to tell me? He said, look, I suffered from PTSD. At one stage, I was suicidal. One of my best friends shot himself shortly after I'd had a phone call with, with him. Um, I did get treatment, and I actually think it's important that all veterans should get treatment. And um, what we've just heard is that the um, detention order, he voluntarily admitted himself to a mental hospital and 
with the supervision of a local sheriff, he was admitted to a mental health facility for a short time where he got treatment. And uh, interestingly, the, um, the media hasn't obtained this order from uh, any normal FOI process. It's clearly been leaked from within the government, from within the intelligence community. So it's very relevant because David, in his hearing a, a couple of weeks ago, he actually talked about the fact that he knew there were ongoing reprisal efforts being taken against him by sections of the intelligence community who essentially want to try and discredit him, who want to try and shut him up. And um, uh, I don't think even he expected that somebody would stoop so low as to try and use somebody's mental health history, uh, PTSD suffering, as a way of trying to discredit him, because it's going to blow up in their faces. I mean, Dave's an honourable serviceman. He's a veteran of the Iraq and Afghanistan wars. And um, it has terrible overtones of the Daniel Ellsberg break-in where a psychiatrist's office was broken into. I think the guy's name was Fielding. And he was the psychiatrist who was treating Daniel Ellsberg while he was the whistleblower for the Pentagon Papers back in the 1970s. And um, in the course of um, uh, his negotiations with the newspapers to get these very sensitive documents about the Vietnam War published, Daniel Ellsberg's very sensitive psychiatric medical records were released by uh, sections of the intelligence community in what essentially turned out to be an abortive bid to try and discredit him. And I just find it amazing the same things are now happening with Grush because it's very, very disturbing. It's reprehensible behaviour and it shows, frankly, that the intelligence community has nothing but contempt for the rules of Congress because... Mm. The Inspector General of the Intelligence Community has actually warned the Intelligence Community and the Defence Department not to take any further reprisals or harassment against Mr Grush. And the fact that they're doing this kind of thing in clear breach, in clear abrogation of the undertakings they've given to Congress is utterly reprehensible. And the most important thing to come to the point that you're making is that it sends a very shocking message to potential whistleblowers. It's essentially a very chilling message to anyone thinking about coming forward that if they do, they can expect to have their past life trawled through looking for shit, looking for dirt. And um, look, I can tell you, I mean, I'm talking to people myself from within the legacy program or people who purport to have knowledge of the legacy program the crash retrieval reverse engineering program, and they are. They're waiting to see what happens with the uh, treatment of David Grush. And so a lot of what happens to David really depends on what happens next with mm. any Senate or House hearings in the Congress. Because I know a lot of people are proclaiming that it's only a matter of time before there is going to be a hearing and eventually all the truth will be revealed in a full public you know, declamation of the misdeeds of the intelligence community. I'm not so sure. I'm not hearing the right messages from Congress that there are going to be hearings yet. And more importantly, the committees that do the hearing, it really has to be either the Armed Services Committee in the House or the Senate or the Intelligence Committee in the House or Senate. That's the House Permanent Select Committee for Intelligence or the Senate Select Committee for Intelligence. Because they're only the two committees that really have the power to subpoena witnesses, to call people under oath and demand that they give evidence. And uh, David has named names. He's basically detailed in very detailed evidence, both to the Inspector General and to Congress. He has detailed the names of people whom he suggests, both hostile and friendly, whom he suggests should be called. But there's no point in calling them unless the committees have the power to actually hear their evidence. And in order for committees to do that, they quite literally have to be read in. They have to be briefed on the SAPs about which they're conducting the questioning. And more importantly, I actually suspect a lot of that questioning would have to be held in camera. It would have to be held in secret, in a skiff, in a secure room inside the Congress, rather than in any public hearing. So the notion that you're going to see sort of chapter and verse details of the legacy program, naming names, naming individuals, naming code words, I don't think you're going to see that yet. I mm, suspect definitely. there is going to be, as there already has been, there's been very extensive, quiet hearings behind the scenes where people like Grush have given evidence and other first-hand witnesses have given evidence. And that evidence is now being weighed and assessed by different sections of the Congress. And the big question is, 
the political momentum is key. What happens? What's Senator Kirsten Gillibrand going to do? She seems to be putting a lot of her faith in um, Dr. Sean Kirkpatrick, the current director of ARO, the All Domain uh, Anomaly Resolution Office. And um, I'm not sure that that faith is well placed, to be perfectly honest, because Dr. Kirkpatrick hasn't shown a willingness yet, or essentially an ability yet, to be proactive in rigorously investigating the allegations that Mr. Grush has shown. And I can tell you that at this stage, Senator Gillibrand has not yet met with Mr. Grush. Mr. Grush is meeting with people in Congress, and he's very happy to provide information to anyone who's, who's authorised to receive that information. But I guess at the moment, it's a bit of a wait and see. We're waiting and seeing how much political momentum there is in Congress. I suspect Congress is going to be even more angry and determined to get to the truth, ironically, after this abortive effort by somebody in the intelligence community to discredit Mr. Grush. Um, mm. I think Congress is fast waking up to the fact that there really is a lot of truth behind Mr. Grush's allegations, and it is worthy of intense and thorough investigation. And, and just to um, go back to what you were saying before, it sounds like someone in the intelligence community is, is going to land in some serious hot water with this being a, a potential HIPAA violation. Uh, you know, for those that are watching that aren't aware of HIPAA, it's the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act. So is that something that you think Congress would want to get to the bottom of as well? <laughs> Absolutely. Well, I mean, we, we know because Dave's been told by the reporter who's approached him that um, uh, essentially the reporter has been leaked uh, the temporary detention order held by the police department for the medical evaluation. And, and that's essentially a very sensitive document because it details personal medical history, mental history. And it's essentially, David's authorised me to speak about this. It details the fact that at the time he was suicidal. He wanted to die. He was confronted by the awfulness of what he'd experienced in Afghanistan and he couldn't deal with it. And the good thing is, and the message he wants to get out there to veterans, is he sought help. He asked for help and he voluntarily admitted himself to a, a mental facility where he got the treatment he needed. And the most important thing, if anyone's trying to discredit him, it's a stupid argument because he kept his security uh, clearance. So, so whoever it was who does the extremely rigorous and very demanding clearance checks for top secret compartmentalized security clearances like Dave's, he kept one of the highest security clearances in the United States. This is a guy who, as I've said repeatedly, was cleared to the very, very highest levels. He was privy to over 2,000 special access programs. And so the idea that somebody could use the fact that he was mentally affected by his PTSD for some time to try and discredit him is utterly reprehensible because the incredible resources of the Defence Department Security Review Office found that there was no basis for such an adjudication. They allowed him to keep on working and indeed there's no suggestion at all of any ongoing mental health issues. It's just, I'm just gobsmacked. I mean, it's a reprehensible grub low act by somebody to try and, and it's a, it's a sign of desperation, frankly, mm. that somebody in the intelligence community has done this. I find it hard to believe that somebody at the highest levels of the intelligence community would authorise such a grub act. I just hope it's one individual and I hope that individual is eventually outed and prosecuted under the HEPA legislation. Mm -hmm. And, and that's uh, two years. Uh, SCI Ross with polygraph as well. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, uh, I mean, it's it's just absurd. I mean, I, I know because I talk to a lot of people in the intelligence community. I know how tough those top secret SCI clearances are, and I've got friends that have gone through it in Australia. The whole process of positive vetting is just intimidating. I would never pass. Um, and the uh, the hilarious thing is, um, you know, Dave has suffered on his own admission, terrible mental problems because of the PTSD he suffered. Imagine having your best friend shoot himself. Uh, yeah. It'd just be a horrible experience. And um, for somebody to try and make political capital out, that, out of that by seeking to denigrate a whistleblower, what a, what a bastard act. What a grub act. Desperation, like you said. Uh, and only days after the historic UAP hearing, you know, we had uh, Matt Gates, Anna Paluna Luna, uh, Anna Paulina Luna, Tim Burchett and Jared Moskowitz 
you know, submit a letter to Speaker Kevin McCarthy requesting a select committee on UAP. Do you think that effort would be uh, redundant due to the fact that many on that committee don't hold the appropriate clearances to hear his testimony? Well, we already saw this happening, Grant, and it's a good point because um, both uh, Tim Burchett and uh, uh, Luna have actually acknowledged that they accompanied Matt Gates to a base at Eglin Air Force Base in Florida at one stage where they were wanting to view video that had been recorded by US Air Force pilots. And um, unfortunately, there might have been US Navy pilots, but unfortunately, they were blocked by the Brigadier General at that base because neither Luna nor Burchett apparently had the clearances. And so a committee can be read in, I'm told. I'm told mm -hmm. that they can apply for and seek the necessary clearances to be read into certain things. Um, but it would certainly be a lot easier. I know, um, uh, what's her name? Congressperson Nancy Mace, I think her name is. She's the woman who asked the question of Dave about getting the hostile and friendly witnesses at the hearing. Yep. She's apparently uh, a member of the Armed Services Committee as well as a member of the Oversight Committee. And one possibility is that they might use the HASC, the House Armed Services Committee, to hold a select committee hearing in which witnesses can be subpoenaed, ordered to appear. And boy, I mean, I, I know the names of some of the people who have been responsible for harassing whistleblowers inside the Defence Department and the intelligence community. And I can tell you it is going to be Judgment Day. It is going to be Intelligence Service Armageddon if and when those people are called because there has been some reprehensible behaviour behind the scenes, appalling behaviour possibly criminal behavior by people mm. in the intelligence community. And I'm looking forward to the day that Congress does its job and calls these people to be held to account. And when that day comes, do you think then it is, um, there's an expectation from the SecDef, you know, Lloyd Austin and, and Avril Haines to, to come forward and say, look, we need to clean house here if there's some bad apples that are, uh, you know, uh, doing some abhorrent, things to uh, discredit and, and these reprisals that have been um, you know, alleged by David Grush. Do you think there are, it's, it's a reasonable for the American taxpayer to think that defence leadership and intelligence committee leadership needs to come forward publicly and, and address that? It, 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 it's, it's not just a good idea. It's absolutely essential that this happen. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I mean, you don't get many more serious allegations than what Mr Grush has raised. Mr Grush has made criminal allegations against sections of the intelligence community. He's suggested that witnesses have told him that people have been murdered to conceal the existence of these programs. Um, we never had anything like that in Watergate 50 years ago in the 1970s. Um, Watergate, people weren't murdered. They were just threatened. People like Daniel Ellsberg had their psychiatrist's office broken into. That's not exactly what's happened with Mr. Grush, but it's getting pretty bloody close. Um, I don't know. I mean, it just amazes me, frankly, Grant, that we are not in a situation yet where Congress is just going all out on this issue. Um, we've seen the Chuck Schumer Senate Majority Leader legislation, which in and of itself is just extraordinary. Um, that's, that's very exciting because it shows very, very clearly that Congress knows something sufficiently for them to put the words non-human intelligence into legislation. And it is now legislation before the House of Congress, passed by the, by, by the House of Congress, mandating disclosure of any knowledge of a non-human intelligence or of NHI technology. We've even got eminent domain legislation, which requires the confiscation of such technology, even if it's held by private aerospace. This is unprecedented. And what people don't understand, and I'm, I feel like a scratchy record going on and on about it, is that the, uh, the simple fact is Congress already has the evidence. Mr. Grush and other witnesses over the past two years have given evidence in secret to mm. the Intelligence Oversight Committees of Congress. They've told Congress already the names, dates, places, locations, code names, all of the details of the alleged 
crash retrieval and reverse engineering program. The information's also been provided to the Intelligence Community Inspector General. One of the bullshit claims that's circulating almost certainly defence or intelligence service disinformation at the moment on social media, one of the bullshit claims is that Mr Grush's reprisal complaint that was upheld by the Inspector General was only a, an upholding of his allegations about reprisals. It's not. I've double-checked this with Mr Grush this morning. The Inspector General of the Intelligence Community heard Mr. Grush's complaint about reprisal and harassment for what he said was his revelations of an illegal attempt to circumvent congressional oversight. And in order to investigate that illegal circumvention of congressional oversight, the Inspector General heard Mr. Grush's allegations about the crash retrieval program and the reverse engineering program. He then called first-hand witnesses, witnesses from the legacy retrieval program. Those people have given evidence under oath to the Inspector General. That's why this is so important. The idea that we're still waiting for this stuff to be revealed to Congress or, or to the Inspector General is utter bollocks. It already has it's already been. happened. Yeah. Do you know of this already has, and that's what's informed Schumer's mm. legislation. That's right. why, I mean, you do not get somebody of the power of the Senate majority leader, probably the third most powerful person in Congress, passing legislation like that and publicly backing yeah. it without, without the support knowing. of the White House and mm. without the support of the majority members inside the Senate Intelligence Committee. Yeah. It's quite clear a decision yeah. has been made by Congress that there are very serious um, truths revealed by Mr. Grush's allegations, and they're after them like a dog on a bone. They're going there. And, and rightly so. And one of the things I always was asking myself when David Grush first came out and, and you interviewed him on, on News Nation is if the allegations of reprisals against David Grush, are, as per his IG complaint, are legitimate, but his claims of a deeply covert UAP crash uh, retrieval program being illegally withheld from Congre Congress, if that was bullshit, why would there be any reprisals against him? Uh, so, well, basically because people don't want this story out. I mean, I mean, if, you, if you're somebody in the intelligence community and you have committed crimes and you're, you're basically worried that this is going to get exposed, hmm. I, I, there is a huge problem in the United States that that Congress is intimidated by sections of the military and intelligence community. And it seems to have lost sight of the fact that back at the time of the Church Commission, hor horrific legislation, sorry, horrific revelations were revealed of breaches of the law, criminal breaches of the law by the CIA, running intelligence operations illegally against American citizens. They had assassination programs against foreign leaders. There was the revelations of the MK Ultra, illegal experiments involving psychedelic drugs on unwitting citizens. Shocking stuff. And as a result of that shocking revelation that came out in the 1970s, laws, regulations were passed to restrain the intelligence community and make it more answerable to Congress. And this is why the Grush allegations matter, because... Congress realized 50 years ago it had lost contact with oversighting properly things that were going on inside the intelligence community. The CIA in particular was allowed to run feral and it got out of control. It broke the law. It committed crimes, terrible crimes, horrible things were done. Oversight rules were brought in place to stop that from happening. Now, the key allegation, the key issue that lies behind Mr. Grush's claims is that those oversight rules have been flouted, that people in the intelligence community have knowingly, wittingly sought to evade congressional oversight. And, and uh, Bill's holding up one of my favorite books. I love Legacy of Ashes. It's a Tim Weiner book, New York Times author Tim Weiner. Fantastic book that details not only the illegal and indeed sometimes criminal operations by the CIA, but it also details how there's just a 
a litany of failed operations from the Second World War right through to the present day that never achieved the intelligence objectives that the CIA set out to achieve. And so you ask, why would people be taking reprisals against Mr. Grush? Simple, to shut him up. Mm, yeah. And do you think, and, and Bill and, and Jeff, I want to go to you, but do you think this will lead to uh, a, a, a new church committee or, uh, as you first suggested, a truth and reconciliation um, type approach down the road to... To, to get people uh, to, to get reform happening and to get people to come forward with what they know and have a uh, have this limited immunity period where this can just be all put out in the open sunlight being the best disinfectant yeah I, I can understand Ross's pessimism but uh, one would hope that given the gravity of what's being stated that uh, it should lead to more hearings and, and more investigations yeah, uh, there's there's a long history of this kind of thing, observation and all that kind of stuff, avoidance, uh, uh, sort of uh, penalising witnesses, that kind of thing. Uh, it, it's hard to say whether or not it's all going to emerge and see the, the hard light of day. One, one hopes mm. it will. Um, yeah, I'd just like to say too that we also take uh, prominence in that the family jewels was actually an internal memo by disgruntled CIA officers that were disgusted with what they knew was going on. And they wrote that list to um, William Colby, who was the director and he fronted the church committee. So it's a high level leadership thing that the rank and file were disgusted with. And the, the number one was revealed in December this year. It was human trafficking. And that was, James P. O'Connell, he was the one running the human traffic trafficking for providing prostitutes to foreign leaders. But they declassified that, but then redacted the next couple of pages. So they're happy to declassify human trafficking. But what else is in there that they couldn't declassify? That um, So hopefully the people in the intelligence agencies have, will have had enough and mm. we'll push from the inside as well. And if we fast forward a bit, you know, we, we have some forward thinking. You know, the, the last thing that you said on your recent Need to Know with, uh, with Bryce Abel Ross was uh, watch Donald Trump. And we know that in, uh, in June, presidential candidate uh, Nikki, uh, Nikki Haley was, uh, I'll pull up my, my notes here, um, she was quoted as saying, if I can find the right page, here it is. Uh, she basically was not um, up to date with what was going on on this, uh, on this topic, but it sounds like that there's a uh, potential for the UAP issue to become a presidential debate talking point. Uh, do, do you see that happening? And do you see these uh, Republican presidential candidates that are putting their names forward um, bringing themselves up to speed on, on this topic if it is going to be uh, debate worthy? Well, I certainly, if I was a reporter on the campaign trail, Grant, I'd be asking questions of every presidential candidate about what they're saying they're going to do about this issue. I mean, you don't get... I mean, the, the thing that I find really strange about this is the willful silence of so much of the legacy media in properly covering this issue. You know, they've been so happy to publish the unverified allegations of anonymous informants to support the search for weapons of mass destruction that didn't exist inside Iraq. You know, many, many times, media, national security reporters glibly report the assertions of so-called intelligence officials to push a line. And here we have one of the most senior, most highly cleared intelligence officials in America. Seriously, his name was often on a list with the president as cleared to know certain things on a very, very small list. Dave was given extraordinary access because of the role that he played. Mm. And if the idea that a presidential candidate wouldn't be fired up about covering this issue just bewilders me. I know Trump's been briefed 
because he indicated very, very strongly to Don Jr., his son, in the run-up to the um, 2020 election, I think it was June 2020, he did an interview with Don Jr. where he acknowledged that he'd been briefed about Roswell and that he found what he'd been told about Roswell very interesting. And I'm told that Trump was given a selective briefing about the crash retrieval reverse engineering program. And I defy him to to challenge otherwise. It'll be really interesting if anybody ever asks him that question at a press conference, what's he going to say? And I guess I'm not, I'm not suggesting Trump or indeed anyone should breach national security, but I think that it behoves any president, past, former or serving or intending to basically um, acknowledge what they're being told privately. Why would it be a secret, such a sensitive secret, if it's true, that the United States is in possession or knowledge of the non-human intelligences that Mr. Grush describes? Why can't we be told that? Why would it be kept secret? What's the hubristic, arrogant thought inside the intelligence community that tells a president that this has to be kept confidential? I think we're at a very interesting point in history here, because I do know that within months, there are going to be very senior serving or former officials coming forward to talk about what they know, as well as legacy program witnesses coming forward to give firsthand evidence to the Congress, in addition to the evidence that's already been provided. At mm. some stage, there has to be a tipping point. And I guess, frankly, the White House has to decide whether it wants to be on the right side of history. And to me, the fact that Senator Chuck Schumer passed that legislation, pushed personally with his endorsement, that extraordinary National Defense Authorization Act amendment, which talks about non-human intelligences over 20 times, mm -hmm. the fact that such legislation has gone into the book is enormously significant. I think we're about to see a shift I'm not saying that the White House is going to stand at a lectern and suddenly start talking truth. But I think that at the moment, what people don't seem to realize is that even very, very senior officials in the Pentagon and the intelligence community aren't briefed into this stuff. I mean, uh, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, General Mark Milley, the other day admitted that he didn't know anything about a crash retrieval or reverse engineering program. My sources are telling me that the chairman of the JCS doesn't know. He hasn't been briefed. Briefed. Get nice. that. So if you're the chairman of the Joint Chief of Staff and you're woken up at 11 o'clock at night and somebody's telling you that there are strange objects in the air over the Arctic between the US and Russia, and these objects are moving at hypersonic speeds towards the United States, don't you think it's important for the chairman of the Joint Chief of Staff, who's responsible for advising the president on how to respond to any potential ICBM attack, don't you think it's important that the chairman of the Joint Chief of Staff know, know about, about this program? Exactly. This is, this is how out of control this is. And mm. I, I've had people raise with me as an issue of concern that very senior people in the Pentagon and the intelligence community are not briefed into this material. Mm. This is why it matters. We've never been at a more dangerous time in world history as far as nuclear weapons go. The Bulletin of Atomic Scientists clock is closer to midnight now than at any other time in history, including the Cuban Missile Crisis. So the fact that it's being kept improperly from Congress and it's being kept improperly from certain presidents and improperly from certain key defense officials is absolutely outrageous. And I, I think there needs to be a reckoning about this. It's beginning to look like the president and the executive leadership of the United States are incompetent in their yeah. failure to do the right thing and, and properly investigate this matter. Uh, uh, and going back on that, a question for all of you, I guess. Um, why do you think Donald Trump would be briefed on the UAP and legacy program when presidents before him have not? because he asked. Um, it's as simple as that. A president is given the same entitlement to information, except when they do egregious things allegedly like Donald Grant Trump has done and start taking home secret files. But presidents are given the same security briefings as the president. So, and how, so does that, 
How, but what about Jimmy Carter, though? Because he'd well, Jimmy Carter. I mean, that's a very good example. We know from Dan Sheehan, the um, civil rights attorney, that President Carter did ask for a briefing by the CIA, and he was allegedly declined by George Bush Senior. Mm-hmm. But what we do know, I, I've heard this more recently, is that after a Congressional Research Service inquiry was done, in which um, Dan Sheehan was involved, and during which Mr. Sheehan became aware of documents that showed pictures of retrieved craft, I'm told that the president was subsequently briefed. So even Jimmy Carter was subsequently briefed and told about aspects of a non-human intelligence with this planet. Right. Okay. I think, didn't he um, have a, a, a sighting on his campaign trail with a bunch of people while he was He did, Jeff, yeah. yeah. He did. Right. And look at JFK. Apparently JFK was told while he was a representative in 1947, only weeks after Roswell, what had happened by, I believe it might have been Stuart Symington. So that was a problem when he became president. He already knew. So... You know, they, they'd lost that ace of not briefing the president because the president already knew. He'd been in Germany straight after the war with Forrestal looking for the miracle weapons that you know, they thought they might have been the Foo Fighters or something else. They went looking for it. So he already knew, and he knew it, the war was being pulled over the president's eyes. And the, the former president before him actually said exactly that in his farewell speech. So... Interesting. That JFK was a big problem for him. And I know that you've done quite a lot of research, uh, Jeff, on, on James Jesus uh, Angleton, who has a very interesting connection to that all, which uh, I'll be happy to put in the link in the description below. But, um, Bill, I wanted to get your thoughts and, and maybe then from you, Ross and, and Jeff. Do you think that the the ontological shock that is really a symptom of would be a symptom of disclosure or, or as Bryce Zabel refers to it, uh, as confirmation. Do you think that ontological shock is a threat to the national security of the United States? And that may be a reason why the White House does not make a confirmation if, if, that's, if that's a plausible scenario. Um, well, well I, th- I think uh, there's so much information that's already out there Things like uh, UFOs and government. Um, so I think all congressional members should be getting a copy of that because uh, the history is there. There's, there is so much data out there. Sure, the mm-hmm. legacy programs of crash retrieval aren't that well revealed at this stage, but there's enough information out there for people to start asking serious questions. And uh, I admire what uh, people like Ross and others have been highlighting rushes of the world, etc. There's, there's so much of this information already out there. It's, uh, it's amazing that it hasn't really uh, seen the full light of day yet. And, and, and Ross, ontological yeah, anger yeah. as well. It, yes. I don't know if you saw Chris Leto. He was angry that, that this had been kept. And he was a, a F-16 fighter pilot. He was a serviceman. He was angry that this had happened. So that's ontological anger, which I think we'll start seeing a bit more of. And so to that end, do you think that there is the potential for a, an Occupy the White House <laughs> type effect if this is revealed or confirmation comes from the White House uh, and then the general populace know once and for all that this has been um, hidden from the American public, American taxpayer for 80 plus years, that there will be a, an uprising or a uh, uh, the you know the equivalent of a, uh, a a mob lynching where where the general public will just want uh, to to express their anger why they've been kept in the dark for so long. Ross is probably better at answering that, but I, I guess that's what they're scared of. Uh, do you want my response? I mean, yeah, I mean, I, 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 it, it's it's all about covering their butts. I mean, I I, I think we are really at a I, I mean, I, I feel like a scratchy record on this because I, I'm, I, I was, as a young law student, I, I studied the Watergate hearings as an example of a public inquiry. Um, New Zealand, when I was studying law, was going through the trauma of the revelation that Air New Zealand had covered up 
terrible things that led to the crash of a DC-10 into Mount Erebus in Antarctica. And as a young law student, I was actually involved in covering that inquiry and, and looking at the administrative law implications of how such an inquiry gets set up. And I still remember Justice Mann, the lawyer that... Um, presided over the inquiry, a former Supreme Court judge, and he said that Air New Zealand was guilty of an orchestrated litany of lies. And I remember feeling the power of how an independent, objective inquiry, properly assessing evidence, could reach such a conclusion, and how what it did was it reinforced the rule of law, it reinforced the, the values that we hold so dear in a democracy. And at the moment in America, there is a really grave constitutional crisis emerging. You've got a Congress that is, is almost intimidated about taking on the intelligence community and the Defence Department. You don't get any more serious allegations than those that have been raised by Mr. Grush, but there is such a conspicuous silence from broad sections of the of the uh, media and indeed from the commentariat from the, the the opinion leaders most often you've had these silly little articles that have appeared in major masthead newspapers essentially trying to mock the whole thing and ridicule and it's really interesting because they've tried to use stigma they've tried to use ridicule and deprecation that hasn't worked the 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 the, the big difference here now is social media. There is so much power now on social media. And, and to their horror, the, the people in the intelligence community and the Defence Department can't control that commentary. And so what they're now doing is they're trying to use more intimidatory tactics like reprisals against people like Grush. And I think, frankly, what that's intended to do is to send a chilling message to any other potential whistleblowers because they know people are coming forward. I know more people are coming forward to Congress right now. I know more people are coming forward to the Inspector General. And the big question is going to be whether the United States, the country that probably has done more than any other country in the world to try to spread democracy through the world, whether it's going to show itself capable of maintaining its own democracy. You know, th this is a very chilling moment for oversight and accountability at the very highest levels of the US government. There are grave allegations, shocking things that, that need to be properly investigated. And there are people in that community that don't want this revealed. There are people who are arguing quite genuinely, I know, okay, this is pretty bad, but gee, it's not good for our government. It's not good for our country for this kind of dirty laundry to be aired publicly mm -hmm. right now. Yeah. Better to bury it. So this is why public momentum Public outrage is so important. People need to let their congressperson and their senators know that this matters to them. They need to write letters. They need to rattle the cage and, and basically make it clear they want answers. Do you think with this, you know, the, the News Nation interview that you did, Ross, with David was a real catalyst? Do you think that uh, there are opportunities for other witnesses to come forward and sit down with you and go on the record uh, as... Uh, if they're fearful of, of going to ARO because they fear they're not going to be taken seriously or they don't know how to contact ARO and those sorts of things. There are other witnesses who are... I've actually discouraged one from going on the record because I know that they would seriously risk putting themselves in breach of their security oath if they did. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's a very, very difficult situation. People need to understand that David Grush did not break any laws when he came forward and did his interview with myself and Leslie Kane and Ralph Blumenthal. He sought Defence Office pre-publication security review approval, DOPSA approval, and he got it incredibly. I don't quite know how that happened, but it happened. And I think one of the reasons why DOPSA was um, authorised to allow David Grush to do his interview was because the intelligence community was completely wrong-footed by his request. They know that somebody of his caliber, somebody of his unimpeachable reputation comes forward and gives evidence. If they let him give his interview within the constraints of the DOPSA approval and authorization, at least then they could try and control it. Mm. The, the problem would have been if Mr. Grush had just gone rogue and revealed all of what he knows 
and even he doesn't want to do that. You know, he he respects and understands the need, the reason why there are national security constraints on revealing things. Now, let's assume that it's true for a moment that the United States does have retrieved non-human spacecraft. Let's just assume for a moment that that's true. Hypothetically, it's entirely plausible that they might have developed, I don't know, particle beam weaponry or the capacity to do some form of positive lift propulsion using technologies that we don't yet understand. Maybe they've developed stealth technology that's been incorporated into some other weaponry. I can fully understand why, especially in a very dangerous international situation right now, the, um, the US might not want to reveal that. But what I don't understand is why the president is showing such a lack of leadership. Joe Biden mm -hmm. looks like a bloody idiot right now. You know, you've got senior people, heads of former heads of CIA, former director of national intelligence, John Ratcliffe, openly talking about the possibility, if not the likelihood, of a non-human intelligence on this planet. It's breathtaking. I'm, I'm, I've had conversations myself with very senior people, former and serving in the intelligence community, who leave me in absolutely no doubt whatsoever that they believe that there is a non-human intelligence engaging with this planet. Yeah. I, for the life of me, whenever I've asked these people, I've said, okay, is there any good reason why the public can't know that? And they go, you know what? No, mm. there's not. No and and begs, know that. begs the question, what confidence does the American public have that the White House is going to be transparent on this issue when they still haven't released any footage on those three unidentified aerial objects that were shot down back in February? Yeah. Uh, they'll, they'll happily release MQ-9 Reaper drone footage uh, that'll come out of the Pentagon and the U-2, but they won't release... Uh, you know, footage of these three uh, possibly prosaic, we don't know, objects that were brought down. So um, well, on I'm, that, I'm have you heard anything I'm more on the dead that, horse? Thing? I'm pretty confident that one of those objects, the first one in Alaska, was Alaska. not prosaically explained. Right. I'm, I'm told by my own sources that the object was hit by the missile and that whatever it was, it kept on going. And a little bit wow. was seen to drop off it. But the full circumstances of the provenance of the video and uh, the evidence of the pilot are things that ought properly to be being investigated. Which leads me to, to you, Bill and Jeff. Uh, obviously, China and Russia are, are keeping a close eye on, on all of this as it unfolds. What, what do you suspect their estimate of the situation is as they watch this from, from afar? China's always been pretty closed, etc. There's, there's a sort of a uh, a manipulation that often goes on with a lot of the civilian groups in China, and it's uh, such a, a tightly controlled country. Um, you know, I've had three trips back to China uh, looking at the UFO scene there, and there's an extraordinary amount of information there among civilian groups, but it's still a very controlled country. And uh, frankly, if I was given a, a free offer to return to China, uh, given the types of research that I've been doing there, I doubt if I'd go because uh, there are a lot of problems with uh, the free flow of information and things being looked at and the nature of investigations one needs to take that would be misunderstood. And so uh, I wouldn't like to be spending my, the rest of my retirement sort of sitting in a <laughs> Chinese jail just because something was misinterpreted. Right. Uh, because I, I, I gave lectures to uh, one of the major defence-orientated universities there, um, and this was at 9 o'clock at night, pretty hard for a Western audience to understand uh, the level of interest in the subject and yet uh, to get a bunch of Australian students in senior science faculties out at uh, 9 o'clock at night for a public lecture on UFOs uh, would be a difficult thing to do here in the West but certainly it dismayed me that that was happening in China and the amount of interest from uh, students and these are people that are uh, filling aeronautical roles um, Fence roles, etc., uh, in, in the future um, sort of evolution of uh, Chinese interest. And so so uh, uh, it's startling what's happening to a certain degree, but it's all very, very controlled. And, uh, mm. There's a lot more uh, openness in places like France and other places, etc., uh, to the whole UFO question. We don't necessarily need to rely 
on what's happening uh, in terms of uh, defence hearings and, and uh, uh, Senate hearings and that kind of stuff. There's, there's so much data out there in the public domain uh, from, from various countries that uh, uh, there shouldn't be any doubt. If anybody takes the time to drill down into the publicly available information that's been there for decades, uh, one come to a, a pretty strong conclusion that there's a definite phenomenon going on here that has yeah. that, that really deserves to be openly scrutinised, and it's, it's happening now. Uh, and uh, I just I'm just troubled by the fact that we're always obsessed with the, the secret side of the story, and yet there's the public side that's been there available, uh, ready to drill down into there for decades now. Been examined. Uh, mm. Yeah. So. Yeah, you know, there's there's an open scientific inquiry here. It's already been happening for decades. We just need mm. to get real and dig into it and dive down into it. Yep. And any, uh, if you want to weigh in there, Jeff, I'm just resigned to the fact now that Operation Mockingbird has far exceeded its original things, and there's a certain percentage of the population that will never believe, no matter what information comes out. If China and Russia do come out and say something, it'll just be written off as disinformation or fake or whatever. So basically, I don't bother with those people anymore. It's unfortunate, but that's the way I, I look at it at the moment. Well, look, um, gents, I, I'm mindful of your time, but I, I knowing that I have a, a, an Australian audience, I just wanted to get your take on uh, Australia's involvement or rather complete lack thereof <laughs> in this topic thus far. And, and maybe very briefly, uh, Bill, you know, Australia's had almost as long as a history as the United States investigating the, the UAP issue. We referred to it as unusual aerial sightings, UAS back in the day. And you have the you had the privilege and pr pleasure of meeting and, and getting to know and interview Harry Turner before he passed away. For folks that maybe don't know, are you able just to offer uh, a brief s summary of who Harry Turner was and what his involvement was in the topic? Well, Harry Turner's involvement was probably uh, at, at two levels. Um, there was his involvement during the 1950s, where as a um, uh, person with a classified background, he chose to do both a public investigation. Um, he wrote anonymously to one of the uh, uh, newspapers of the day down in Victoria, um, uh, argued that there was a real UFO phenomenon going on, sort of public investigations of it but behind closed doors because of his classified security clearances he was able to get access to the early uh, I guess first five years or more of the uh, uh, director of Air Force intelligence files and he was asked to do a uh, scientific appreciation of that data and in 1954 he released a report to Air Force intelligence that indicated that when compared to the US data that was available through the likes of people like Donald Keogh, that there was a real phenomenon and that probably it had an extraterrestrial um, explanation behind it. You know, and this is back in 1954. That report didn't see the light of day until about 1982 when I came across it um, in Air Force file. And it led me to meeting Harry Turner and spending a lot of time with him, examining his files. And I also found that um, when he eventually made his way back into uh, the, the uh, government services, particularly as the head of nuclear science in the Director of Scientific and Technical Intelligence of the early Joint Intelligence Organisation. Uh, he was spending somewhere between 70 to 80% of his time as the head of that, that department investigating UFOs, much to the chagrin of his boss, uh, Bob Mason, uh, hmm. who incidentally was one of the three people that dug the soil that led to the building of uh, Pine Gap. Uh, um, uh, Bob Mason was there with the two CIA guys at the birthing of Pine Gap. And uh, Bob Mason wrote to me and indicated that uh, uh, they never really got around to deciding what they would do if any of this uh, um, sort of investigations of so-called re-entries and crashes uh, turned out to be extraterrestrial. But... Uh, Sure enough, Harry was working in that area and trying to investigate as much as possible, but yeah. was constantly being second-guessed by his superiors within the Georgia Delicious Organisation. Right. 
And and you, Jeff, your your Reddit handle has a, a connection to Harry Turner. Do you want to summarize that very briefly before we uh, talk about Australia's current appetite for the UAP topic? Yeah, that's exactly right, Grant. Um, there's certain things in Harry Turner's report that reference, I believe, part of the majestic documents. Um, the first one is a real document. It's called the Twining Memo. That was an actual secret um, report. It was declassified in 1978. Harry referenced it in 1971, so it's we know it's actual. But that's a classic example of a limited hangout where they write a secret report for distribution to their allies, Britain, Canada, Australia. But the white hot memo that was written uh, four days prior is top secret, no form, not for distribution. It goes right into what they found, but they, they call them unidentified lentic lenticular uh, aerodyne technologies, ULATs. Um, and that's pretty much why I called it Harry is white hot because he's pretty much referencing the fact that the majestic documents, I believe, are correct. He's also mentions one called uh, 948 document, which is where General uh, Hoyt Vandenberg flatly refuses the existence of UFOs and tells uh, the generals to rip it up. He, he just referenced that as 948, but there's a whole heap of other stuff like the, you know, the, the dates that line up in Alan Dulles's calendar that were, you'd have to, it'd be an amazing guess to know that exact date when you met the president twice because he's hit you up and said, I want to know about Majestic 12. Mm. Um, I found that a, a couple of uh, years ago, actually. So that's where my handle comes from. Right, basically. interesting. Okay. Uh, well, look, um, I, I do, for the, the benefit of the audience that maybe doesn't know where Australia sits on the UAP issue, I thought this video montage from some of the comments from Mr Ogles at the recent UAP hearing uh, in contrast with juxtaposed to Australia's current position might be a good starting point. So let me just play that for the benefit of the uh, of the audience. Based off of your own experience or the data that you've been privy to, is there any indication that these UAPs could be uh, essentially uh, collecting reconnaissance information? Mr. Graves? Yes. Mr. Grush? Fair assessment, yeah. Mr. That's Fravor? Very possible. Uh, is it possible that these UAPs would be probing our capabilities? Yes or no, Mr. Graves? Yes. Rush? Yes. Braver? Definitely. Is it possible that these UAPs are testing for vulnerabilities in our current systems? Yes. 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 Possible. Do you feel, based off of your experience and the information that you've been privy to, that these UAP, U, uh, UAPs uh, provide uh, an existential threat to the national security of the United States? Mr. Graves? Potentially. Yes, sir, potentially. Uh, same answer, potentially. Yeah, I'd say Fravor. definitely, potentially. Mr. Graves and Fravor, you know, in the event that your encounters had become hostile, would you, have, would, have, would you have had the capability to defend yourself, your crew, your aircraft? Absolutely not. Sir? No. Is, based off of the information that you've been privy to, is there any indication that these UAPs are interested in our nuclear technology and capabilities? Yes. Uh, by external observation, sure, that could be a fair assessment, yeah. Yes. Mr. Chairman, um, you know, I think I'm the last member to go, but there clearly is a threat to the national security of the United States of America. As members of Congress, we have a responsibility to maintain oversight and be aware of these activities so that, if appropriate, we take action. Incursions in defence training ranges by unidentified objects, uh, intrusions by unknown aircraft or objects would represent serious hazards to the safety uh, of flight and potential threats to security of our operations. Um, you've obviously got strategies in place to do that here. Um, are you aware of reports, I did raise this with uh, the previous Air Marshal as well, of uh, US military exercises being cancelled because of concerns around air safety and observations of UAPs. Is, is this a UFO question? You, it's, you could call them a UFO if you like, right, Senator right. Watt. They're, they're, called, they're now 
technical. So just, just so I'm clear. Unidentified aerial phenomena. What do you think? Do you think it's funny? Australia and the US are the closest of allies, but they couldn't be further apart on the UAP issue. Why is the Australian government, Department of Defence, burying its head in the sand still and, and playing the ignorance is bliss card on, on this topic when it's clearly a national security threat issue and safety of flight issue? Isn't that, a, isn't that of interest to Australia? Isn't that a domain awareness gap that they should be worried about? Who are you asking, Grant? Sorry. To all of you, you can add an opine at your leisure. Um, well, look, I, I, it is a, a huge issue for Australia. And I, I've spoken myself to defence personnel as recently as last weekend who sought me out and wanted to discuss with me sightings that they have had which concern them, which they feel they cannot report to their superiors because if they do so, they're worried that they're going to be the subject of an adverse finding on their uh, flight their flight record. Um, mm. And the reaction, frankly, of Senator Wong there, who should really know better, mm. you know, she tried to use that pejorative of, oh, is this a UFO question? And it was an attempt to basically insinuate that this is such a puerile thing to be raising that the, con that, that the time of the, the committee should not be spent delving into it. I mean, it's just crazy to me at a time when the Congress is passing legislation talking about flight safety and um, national security issues posed by UAPs, talking about NHIs, non-human intelligence, and talking about the search for retrieved non-human technology. It gobsmacks me that we have a foreign minister that has their head so firmly in the sand on this issue. It's appalling, mm. frankly, and same goes with the Defence Department bosses as well. Yeah, we know that you know, to this day, uh, well, uh, as of the 30th of, of July, the Deputy Prime Minister, Minister for, Dense, Minister for Defence, Richard Miles, has not been briefed on the UAP issue. He's met with the US Secretary of Defence, Lloyd Austin, five times in the last 12 months. And out of four of those engagements, I haven't found any records through FOIA that have indicated that UAP has been a, a discussion. Uh, the current Chief of Air Force, Air, Air Marshal Robert Chipman, has not been briefed uh, you know, internally on, on, on UAP. And we know that through the release of uh, Freedom of Information request uh, documents, if I just show this on screen, this was a, a document that I was able to secure for release through FOI last year that amazingly the strategic narrative of the Royal Australian Air Force and Department of Defence is that they're able to come up with a determination as to what UAP are likely to be or not likely to be uh, without having investigated the topic since 1996, without having any engagement with the United States, without being privy to any of the classified data housed within classified reports that have been provided to Congress, and yet they can make a determination that UAP are only these things. So my question is, why would the Australian Department of Defence and RAF seek a briefing or seek information from the air attache in Washington, D.C. on the Chinese spy balloon and those three other objects uh, when they represent exactly the same thing that they've indicated UAP are? Why is there a big hypocrisy in that they're not taking the issue seriously, yet they're going to happily seek information on prosaic objects, which they've clearly identified as UAP? They're boxing I don't, I don't understand the they, mm. they, there's a credibility gap there now. They've boxed themselves right into a corner, and I don't think they know the way out, basically. I mean, and it's written in legislation route, now. Uh, yeah. yeah routinely over the decades, many uh, armed personnel, uh, like our Navy and Air Force and Army, have been routinely told not to describe events that they've witnessed as uh, classic UFO sightings. They uh, want them to be described in reporting as sort of easily explainable things or perhaps natural phenomena, that kind of thing. Uh, only a couple of weeks ago, I spoke to an ex-Australian uh, Navy uh, chap who had a classic sighting off the Western Australian coast. Um, and He was told by his own commander, uh, if he insists on putting it into the official log of the ship, that he describe it as probably some sort of natural phenomena and do not use the terms UFO. Uh, and uh, mm. I've seen that in existing Air Force files, naval files, that kind of thing over the decades. It's, it's been an ongoing kind of policy. And uh, and yet uh, here we are, 
with people like Harry Turner, <laughs> described both back in the 50s and during the early 70s, that there was a clear, um, undeniable kind of um, case for the existence of these objects. It, it's an extraordinary policy. It, it, there's a, a huge uh, delinking going on. It. How do we reconcile this? You know, it, there's clearly a lot more going on behind closed doors than what's being told in the public eye. And Ross, are you sensing a real frustration from people that are current or former members of the Defence Force that aren't currently afforded any sensible see something, say something reporting mechanisms if they see an anomalous, anomalous object or aircraft that they can't identify because there's no special encouragement afforded to the men and women of the ADF if they can't identify an object, which clearly, uh, you know, the United States and RAF have admitted that UAP clearly do pose a safety of flight issue and a national security threat to the United States. Is, is, is the Australian Department of Defence and Royal Australian Air Force uh, breaching its duty of care by not affording, affording, men, affording men and women with sensible reporting mechanisms? Well, as you rightly say, Grant, the, the United States is on record as saying, as you've got published here, UAP clearly pose a flight of a safety of flight issue and may pose a challenge to US national security. I'm talking to servicemen and women who are telling me that these objects have been seen by Australian aircraft uh, going back years, decades. I mean, it's it, one of the most common lines from a lot of the debunkers is that these objects are only seen in the continental USA. And that's cobblers. It's absolute rubbish. These things are being seen all over the world. And Australian pilots are seeing these objects. The big difference is, unlike the United States, we're not encouraging pilots to come forward. Now, one of the things that's been overlooked in a lot of the testimony that's come from Ryan Graves, the former FAA team pilot, who's the head of um, Americans for Safe Aerospace, is that there have indeed been incidents where objects have come narrowly close to colliding with US fighter aircraft in training zones, including one incident that he described recently where it actually collided with the Perspex cockpit of a fighter jet. And when you're flying at supersonic speeds in a fighter jet training for war, the idea that something could collide with the cockpit and, and not be investigated, I mean, it's horrendous. So, of course, this is a national security and flight safety issue. Of course, it should be investigated. Mm. It's a no-brainer. And I, look, I think we follow the United States on a lot of issues, but there's a mm. lot of conservatism in the Defence Department in Australia because we do what our big brother tells us. And oddly enough, some of the most interesting conversations I've had have been with Australian personnel who've deployed to the United States and who found themselves on exchange, often to places like the National Air and Space Intelligence Centre, NASIC. And they've become aware of information that is commonly shared uh, inside the United States. And as well as that, there's the take, the uh, UAP take, which is now being distrib distributed on the CIPRANET, the defense internet, as part of the Five Eyes Alliance. And so anybody who wants to inform themselves, all the chief of air staff or the chief of defense staff needs to do is turn around in his office and tap into the CIPRANET and access the, um, the relevant files. And they can actually see, I'm told, a lot of the videos that we're currently not allowed to see which aren't actually classified because they were recorded in most cases with mobile phones. But um, because they are on the CIPRANET, because they're on the classified internet, can't be revealed. So there is this double standard that's taking place at the moment where you have um, uh, Australia pompously asserting, frankly, oh, you know, we, we're not interested in UFOs, UAPs, it's not an issue for us. And you have senior officials as high as a former director of national intelligence, John Ratcliffe, basically acknowledging that this is real and it may very well be non-human. Mm. And, and I find it interesting that you would think that with RAF's history of uh, investigating you know, UAS, that um, they would be the ones that would be uh, a, a, you know, uh, an appropriate choice to attend the first ever Five Eyes uh, forum on UAP that was led by Dr. Sean Kirkpatrick, 
of, of ARA. And they communicated in confirmed correspondence that they did not attend the Five Eyes Forum on UAP. And it was only really a, a year prior to receiving this correspondence that there was other correspondence from RAF uh, confirming that they did not think that the Five Eyes was the appropriate forum for UAP to be discussed. So there is a, a clear and present disconnect with what's going on within the Australian Department of Defence and RAF uh, with, with counterparts in the United States. And I, I cannot for the life of me, I, and to your point, Ross, I think you know, we're, we're maybe just waiting for Big Brother to give us the green light where we can enter the game. Um, but in the interest, uh, in the interim, I feel very, um, I feel very uh, sorry for those members of the Australian Defence Force that are frustrated with this issue. And if, uh, if they're feeling like they're not being um, given, you know, a, a appropriate reporting mechanisms to, uh, you know, see or reconcile things that they can't identify in the sky or when they're uh, in, the, in the line of duty. It just is a, is a huge disconnect considering that we're in lockstep with pretty much everything else the U.S. does on a defense issue. So anyway, uh, look, I, I am uh, very mindful of the time that you guys have given me today. There were a few viewer questions that came through that I wanted to throw your way. Are you happy to stay on for a, a couple of more minutes just to answer a couple of questions that people have thrown? Somewhere. Perfect. Uh, so it. I guess the the first one I'll throw. Uh, where is it? If I find the first question, uh, Ross, I'll just throw this one your way. So so TP Loft two thousand and eight asks, uh, uh, Ross, have you spoken with any senior Australian official in any political, defence, or intelligence capacity that is actively involved directly with UAP? If so, is there any? Uh, provably verifiable evidence that you're personally aware of? I can't comment. If And, and there's a follow-up to that. Uh, if not, are you... Oh, well, you can't comment, so I won't go into the follow-up on that one. Uh, but I will ask... Uh, the next question that I had was... that came through from... Uh, here we go. This is for, for you, Jeff. Uh, Roger Stankovic asks, um, well, actually for you, all three of you, if the US government has intentions of gaining possession of uh, NHI tech from corporate aerospace companies, what are, the, what are the ramifications of safe and proper handling and storage of crafts and or biologics? Uh, is that something that the, the US has thought of or would already have that infrastructure in place potentially? I think a lot of the... Uh discoveries for instance the john von newman architecture of nearly all microprocessors came from a recovered object so we're going to seem like we're not as smart as what we thought we were there's going to be a lot of uh technology that has been found to we've had help and i think um herman oberth actually said that we've had help from other peoples not of this earth so I don't. I personally don't think they've put that much thought into, thought into those mm. things themselves. Not that far thinking, forward thinking. Um, if I can just add to what Jeff said, I, I think um, one of the issues here that's driving the feeling from within the legacy crash retrieval and reverse engineering program is that there isn't planning in place. Uh, I, I was told that the Pentagon and the um, the president do not have a plan in place for making any kind of an announcement if mm. and when the evidence becomes available of a non-human intelligence engaging with this planet. There isn't any kind of consideration in place. And so the idea of whether or not they have um, procedures for handling biologics or handling technology, I'm sure they do. But um, the, uh, the, the lack of planning and the lack of foresight, I think, is confounded by the stigma and the ridicule that's been attached to this subject. We really do need to move beyond. I mean, I, I've got a lot of respect for Penny Wong. I think she's a great foreign minister, but I'm very mm -hmm. sad to see. I hadn't seen that grab from her. And it, it saddens me to think that politicians think that there's political capital in running the usual bullshit line that that UAPs are just things that can be discredited. We're way beyond that now. Yep. We're way beyond it. I mean, the US has admitted it's real. So mm -hmm. let's deal with it as if it's real and get plans in place because 
sooner or later, I, th I suspect probably within six months to a year, I think eventually the weight and preponderance of evidence that's slowly gathering in the Congress and also in the Inspectors General is going to lead to some necessity for some kind of disclosure. Uh, Bill, did you want to add to that? Well, we're getting information from very diverse streams. Um, we're getting information from sort of uh, alleged sort of crash retrieval programs. I've been getting an earful of this information for decades from various people who represent themselves as being parts of various programs. And uh, uh, the, the general thrust of a lot of this information seems to be that there are multiple legacy programs. There's so much heavy compartmentalisation going on that one hand doesn't know what the other hand is doing. It's, doing. Just, mm. it's, it's, it's not organised and, and uh, it's uh, uh, a pretty sort of messy situation. One would assume that if there are programmes like this going on in places like China and Russia, that it's a, a little bit more heavy-handed control over it. Uh, but uh, meanwhile, in the United States, for example, we seem to have uh, a situation where metalization is the name of the game and it's very difficult to get a coherent picture of what's really going on with it, within these mm. diverse programs uh, that seem to be operating in a number of the different services. And, and Harry, for you, what, what oh, this is for all of you to opine on, but what do you think it will take for more members of Parliament and Australian Senators to, to take this topic seriously. To date, Senator Peter Wish Wilson is the only Australian senator that's had the courage and gumption to ask questions about the UAP topic in an Australian context. And so, uh, and, and the same with the Australian mainstream news media. It frustrates the crap out of me when, you know, the breakfast shows will play the, the X-Files theme at the front end of every segment. You know, kudos to them for covering the topic. But none of them are exercising a shred of uh, you know, journalistic due diligence and asking questions of the Australian Department of Defence. The morning shows have the Minister for Defence on frequently whenever there's something to talk about AUKUS or OSMIN or uh, other uh, Australian defence um, programs, but they will not ask the question, will Australia, our US ally and Five Eyes partners taking this topic seriously? Why isn't Australia taking it seriously? What is Australia doing about this I issue? Do you, do you have a sense as to what it will take for the tides to turn for government, senators, members of parliament and the Australian news media to take this topic seriously? It has to become an uh, election issue. And, you know, you've got permanent Canberra, SES, public servants that their entire life is devoted to the public service so they'll do whatever the minister thinks they want them to do and sway that way write mindef briefs and stuff like that but it, it's going to have to be a uh an election issue unfortunately mm. yeah well I've one just, of the true ironies i, I, I had, had sorry, sorry. yeah That's when, right, I, when i was actually looking at the air force files between 1982 and 84 i was being contacted by the air force intelligence guys to get advice about what information should be supplied to the minister as a briefing. So for that period of uh, two or three years, etc., I seem to be a consultant by default uh, to Air Force Intelligence. It was just a crazy situation. <laughs> they just didn't know their own files most of the time. Uh, look, that's a very good point, Bill. I, I, I think sometimes we in the media tend to see conspiracies where there are none. I actually genuinely think, and I've had conversations with senior people in defence who've actually rung me. I also had a conversation with somebody in a minister's office about this recently. They were asking me for my advice uh, because they'd heard about the, um, the Larry Maguire letter, which mentions the AUKUS agreement. Uh, he's a Canadian MP who raised with the Canadian Defence Minister allegations of a crash retrieval program that Canadian scientists are allegedly working on with the US in Canada. And whilst it's been a, a very qualified and careful and, uh, how does one say this, uh, slippery denial from the Canadian Defence Ministry, um, I'm pretty confident that there is something to the fact that um, 
Canada is working with US scientists on a crash retrieval program. And it does have implications for AUKUS. This is why it matters to Australia, because we're spending the most money in history on any kind of procurement. We're spending $400 billion, and it'll probably be well in excess of that, on attack nuclear submarines from the United mm -hmm. States. What if it turns out that after we've signed these contracts, it's revealed by the US that it's fooled its ally and that it's working on technology that would supersede that technology by thousands of years. What if it turns out that the United States has developed propulsive techniques that they're not revealing to even its Five Eyes allies? That's why they need to be upfront. That's why, frankly, if I was Australia, I would be a demanding answers behind mm. the scenes. I would be asking. And that's why Larry Maguire, the Canadian MP, in his letter to Anand, the Canadian Defence Minister, raised this as an AUKUS issue because he, he said it. He knew that it was a concern that would be raised by other members of AUKUS. And to that point, Ross, do you have any knowledge of Australia's involvement in the Five Eyes Foreign Material Program as it pertains to UAP? I've spoken to Australians, ex-Special Forces, who tell me that they've been involved in a crash retrieval, period. Within Australia or in uh, or there. abroad? Fair, I can't fair comment. Cool. I understand. I, I wanted to see how far you'd want to go on that one. Uh, look, la last couple of questions, folks, and then I'll let you go. Um, so um, this one comes from um, Nick Berry. He asks, uh, Ross, on a recent episode of Need to Know with Bryce Abel, you talked about Congress being under pressure and on the clock to disclose for a reason you can't discuss yet. It sounded quite ominous. How bad is the threat? <laughs> I've revealed all I can reveal. I'm sorry to sound like a mysterious public servant, but I, I, can't, I really can't go there. I'm under obligations to sources. The, I the problem that. I have is, is it's all about sources and methods. If I reveal the extent of what I know, I'm betraying the source. And, and that's rule one of investigative journalism. Um, hey, Grant. Uh, yes, Jeff. I'd just like to point Nick to the Advanced Theoretical Physics Conference in 1985 in the BDM SCIF. BDM were involved in the Nike Hercules missiles. Uh, McDonnell Douglas was involved in the Thor missiles for Bluegill Triple Prime. Mm -hmm. And Los Alamos designed the warheads. Those three entities were represented by Oak Shannon, Bob Wood, and it was in the BDM skiff. So that oh, sounds like sure, it was a I'll defensive sure Nick capability. Gets that, um... Good, good, um, good call. Um, eminent domain. I just want to ask if the so David Grash is not the first whistleblower to have come forward. We know that in 1989, George Knapp revealed uh, Bob Lazar to the world, and he claims to have had in his possession at one point in time Element 115. And uh, George Knapp has stated that publicly. Is there any issues with the uh, how would eminent domain be policed? And would one expect that if Bob, Laz Bob Lazar's claims are true, that he's going to have to surrender element 115 to Aro at some point? What do you mean the element 115 that's been kept in a refrigerator? It's not <laughs> uh, 115 that we know of. Uh, no, that Bob Lazar claims to have had in his possession. Now, again, I'm like you, Ross, I'm very agnostic on, on Bob. I think there are a lot of uh, questions pertaining to his uh, education, but I thought it was interesting that both George Knapp and Jeremy Corbell, who obviously and, and granted know a lot more than we probably do about Bob's, Bob's story, uh, we know that the, the proposed legislation states that current or former, uh, you know, members of government, programs or contracts will need to come forward and reveal information that they're aware of pertaining to UAP to RO once that law is enacted. So is it unreasonable to think that there'd be an expectation for something like that to be surrendered to RO? Well, it'd have to be classed from their cold, dead hands, I think, in the first instance. But with, with regards to Bob Lazar, 
Um, sometimes when you have a top secret clearance or a high level clearance, I'm not allowed to say exactly what level I had or who I work for. I was told in a phone call yesterday, um, you have to make cover stories uh, because, for instance, I told my wife I was going to Melbourne for a job one time and uh, my friend took a photo of us at a nice pizza restaurant in Bondi looking over Harbour Bridge and, yeah, I had to do some real fast talking there. It's, it's hard to remember some of your cover stories sometimes. So that part of the, the his story I don't really take much credit of, but the fact that he said we had or the US had retrieved objects 34 years ago that's something you know the, the rest of it yeah they do that deliberately so we follow rabbit holes and get distracted from the real question but um and i'd, I'd just like to say too grant there's a there's a whole group of people on reddit that helped me out t glozer adventurous ears zesty closed door EBGB, quantum cryogenics they all feed me information one named was but wh01 this is the collaboration that they miss in compartmentalized mm. stuff these guys are just feeding me information and that's where i go from there so um it, if we all get together and share information and hold lightly as john ramirez says you know there's currently an nro disinformation campaign going on twitter about some footage released from a reaper drone and an overhead that says nrl 022 which is a hexagon platform but and it disappears into a portal but we know from the inmarsat data that that plane was in the air for another six hours after the geolocation said it was nicobar islands but what I think is happening now is they're associating NRO with maybe MH370 and it will be proved false. So any information that comes out later on that could possibly be true will just be associated with that. Mm. And mind you, there was a misreduction and an NRO FOIA release in 2020 where there was a um, typo. They called it MK370 and the reviewer missed it. And that's that's on their NRO website. So they they called it the MK three seventy crisis. So they did obviously have an interest in it. And as we know from John Greenwald's stuff, mm -hmm. NRO has to be tasked by someone else to look. They can't just move satellites around to look at whatever they want. Someone has to ask them to do it. So there was an interest there. Interesting. And because right. Dave Grush worked for NRO, I think that's where they're trying to disentangle everything very interesting well look gents um, my final question for the three of you which i found to be an interesting one ryan graves had david fravor on his merge podcast recently and he asked the question uh and i think it's a good question where do you think this story will go in the next five years bill if you want to attack that one have a crack first uh, well, there's a long history of Senate hearings and congressional hearings, and uh, most of them haven't gone that far, but certainly the progress of the current one uh, has been quite substantial, and uh, it kind of argues for a, a bit of optimism. Um, and, uh, but as Ross rightly points out, there are a lot of uh, moving parts here, and it wouldn't take much for the whole thing to be... Uh, slowed down or uh, more to a grinding halt. You know, I've always been an advocate of open, uh, sort of scientifically orientated investigations in the public domain and trying to bypass governments and intelligence organisations. You know, the phenomenon's happening to all of us and it's worldwide. So we shouldn't necessarily be hamstrung by uh, governments that are uh, sort of withholding the true nature of the story. A lot mm. of stuff that can be done in the public domain. Ross, for you, where do you see this story headed in the, in the years ahead? Well, I, I think I've made it pretty clear in other commentary I've done on Need to Know that I'm, I'm very pessimistic at the moment. Um, mm. I, I, I'm not seeing from the senior leadership in the Senate where this really has to happen 
people like Senator Gillibrand, she's very much giving voice to the idea that this can be done within Arrow, which I think is just transparently ridiculous. Uh, I'm, I'm talking to potential whistleblowers, potential witnesses who have no faith whatsoever in Arrow. That's not yeah, to what, say that there uh, aren't some... I beg your pardon, I was, Bill? I was meaning to ask you, Ross, what was your take on uh, um, his uh, comment about this so-called iron drive technology, etc., as a sort of a prosaic explanation for a man-made possibility. It seemed fairly absurd to me because it was really not something that was a, a proven technology and it seemed to be assist, assisted by uh, uh, ordinary devices anyway. Yeah, I, I think you're talking about something that Dr. Sean Kirkpatrick posted on his LinkedIn yeah. channel. Yeah. That's and right. It, it's, it, it's funny. I mean, it's funny for two reasons. Um, he's the nominal director of the body that the... Congress has entrusted to mandate inside the Pentagon a UAP investigation task force. He's the guy who's meant to be doing that work. He's meant to be soliciting uh, information from the public, from Defence Force personnel, from private aerospace personnel. There's no email. There's no way of contacting that body. There's, there's no website. There's absolutely no way. <laughs> There's no phone number. I mean, Twitter it's had one post in July of last year. Yeah, it's had one post on its Twitter. So, mm. I mean, it may very well be. Maybe Senator Gillibrand is right. Maybe Dr. Dr. Kirkpatrick is well motivated. We just don't know. But the simple fact that he's blathering on about iron propulsion drives is a prosaic explanation for the phenomenon. It's just not plausible. And it's not plausible because there are so many experts, multitudinous experts, who have opined on objects like the Tic Tac. If we had an iron drive that could propel something like the Tic Tac, by golly, we'd have it right now and we'd be using it in our um, Defence Force technology. The simple fact is, as multiple people have said, this is not US or any foreign adversary technology. That's an official statement from the US government. That's not me saying that. Mm. That's the evidence that Ron Moultrie and Scott Bray gave to the Congress most recently and the evidence that they gave to Congress. So if it's not technology in human hands, in terrestrial hands, whose is it? Is it? That's the issue. And so this disingenuous argument from people like Dr. Kirkpatrick that we should look for prosaic explanations all the time, how can you look for prosaic explanations when clearly prosaic explanations don't wash. And so what we need is a proactive investigation. And I'm not seeing that in Arrow at the moment. It needs to be properly funded. It needs to be properly tasked. The Congress needs to make clear that they think that Arrow needs to do its job. And so I think a lot hangs over the next six months in whether there are effective hearings. It may very well be we get another hearing from the Oversight Committee, but it's pointless unless that Oversight Committee is able to be read in to the yeah. programs that we want to talk about. And so what, what happens here is there is this layering of security barriers that have been used to obfuscate and to hinder investigation into this issue for so many decades. And so now we're at a crucial point, as Bill says, We've got good reason to be optimistic, but I still err, sadly, mm -hmm. to a pessimistic tone. I don't think we're there yet. You're a, you're a barometer for many of us, Ross. We uh, we go off your inklings from from week to week and need to know. Sure. But to that end, do do you do you suspect that Aro has secured its Title Fifty authority? Because in his ABC interview, Dr. Kirkpatrick said he has access to anything and everything. So yeah, well, I mean, I'm told that they don't. And I've told that they've got limited Title X authority. I actually checked this as recently as this morning. They've right. got limited Title X authority and they've got pretty much bugger all Title 50 authority. So that means they can't inquire into the very special access programs that, that even if they wanted to, David Grush has pointed to the Congress are the ones that ought to be being properly investigated. So it may very well be that Dr. Kirkpatrick is read in to certain programs because he's an individual. The issue is what is Arrow as an organization tasked to be able to do? 
Mm. And, and th there is so much linguistic sophistry coming from the Pentagon on these issues. It's playing word games. And yes, Dr. Kirkpatrick might have access. And indeed, Dave Grush has said that before Dr. Kirkpatrick went to Arrow, he briefed him extensively on what he'd revealed from his interviews with 40 plus people with direct knowledge of the legacy program. The simple fact is that Dr. Kirkpatrick has not sought to, mm. in, to, to further investigate or inquire into what Mr. Grush sought to raise with him. That's the issue. Mm. So, uh, I mean, uh, the bottom line is, I, I think Arrow is an organization that's been set up to fail. And I'm, I was just going to ask I, you I, that. I, I yeah. hope that uh, Senator Gillibrand's confidence in Dr. Kirkpatrick is not misplaced. I'm, I think she's giving him an opportunity to do the right thing. But I can tell you there are people in the Senate who are very impatient because they've read the transcripts of the evidence that David Grush and other first-hand witnesses have given. Mm. And they're not waiting any longer, much longer, for Arrow to come up with some bullshit excuse about why they can't get to the bottom of this. Congress, if it feels that it's being hindered, will push. But it needs public opinion behind mm. it as well. We need to let Congress know that this is something that the public cares about. Yeah, with, I would with say Arrow, too, I would expect that um, Ronald Moultrie needs to be hauled over the coals a bit too, because he's Kirkpatrick's boss, and he hasn't signed off on if he hasn't signed off on Arrow's strategic plan or uh, these uh, programs to be implemented, like a website, a public-facing secure submission system, uh, system, I should say, then Moultrie has uh, a lot to answer for as well. Sorry, sorry, Bill. Yeah, I was just uh, going to uh, cast another opinion. You know, with Arrow, uh, with the background of history, you seem to be seeing echoes of Blue Book all over again. And I'm kind of hoping there's a, a lot more uh, to Arrow than that kind of picture. Um, you know, we'd like to hope there's sort of a deep scientific investigation going on, multitasking, all that kind of stuff. But you know, the picture we're seeing is all far short of that. I, I just hope there's more to it. Mm. Uh, actually, I've, I've just got notes of the conversation I had with somebody in intelligence earlier on today, and they said to me, Arrow does not have jurisdiction over all of Title 10 and Title 50 agencies to depose people, to take evidence under oath from yep. people. The okay. only DOD-based special agents that have full authority are DCIS, which is one of their investigation services inside defence. They're the only ones with full authority. So you've got this ridiculous situation where Susan Goff can't put out an email or a hotline number. There's no codified procedure to refer this to the inspectors general, even if they do find something that's seriously in breach of the law. And uh, Senator Gillibrand appears, and this is from somebody in the intelligence community, Senator Gillibrand naively believes that she will get the oversight result from Congress through Arrow. And the problem for Rubio, the senator, Senator Marco Rubio, is that people have come forward in confidence, but they don't yet have directors or former directors of agencies who are willing to spill the beans. They've got people lower levels coming up. And so it's paralysis by analysis. They don't have enough sources or resources. Um, and in fact, the, the funding for Arrow has only just been approved in these latest defense appropriations. So Congress, frankly, needs to crack the whip. It, that's the only thing that can happen, is Congress needs to rediscover its mojo and remember that this is government of the people, for the people, by the people. Congress is king. And it doesn't instill a lot of confidence in other uh, witnesses to come forward if this is the current state of play with, uh, with Arrow. That's, you, know, you mentioned not long ago, Ross, that you were a bit of a quandary as to what to do. Who do you refer a witness to because of... Uh, Sure. Uh, you know, so, so. well, look, uh, and Jeff, I wanted to give you a chance to say um, uh, your thoughts. Are you optimistic or a little pessimistic on what lies ahead? Uh, the only thing I'm certain of in the next five years is Roscoe will have a Pulitzer Prize hanging on his wall in the back of there. <laughs> Um, I'd well, look, like to be happy with somebody to pay yeah. me to do the journalism I'm hey, doing. Yeah. To be honest with you. <laughs> it's a, 
there's there's uh, there's a, a lot of money in UFO uh, ufology if you're to believe what the debunkers think out there. Mm. But uh, well, look to that end, Ross. I know that you've got a great Q and A session scheduled this weekend in Melbourne. I uh, look forward to catching up and saying good day. But um, what what can folks expect to to hear from you at that event? If you want to give a brief uh, brief announcement. Oh, actually, I've got a really good tip. Um, the source who told me about the um, bubble-shaped craft that somebody told them about at Area 51 was so pissed off with the debunkers that he's given me a little tidbit. Oh, okay. Mm. So some, uh, some, some juice for people in person at this upcoming, which I understand is sold out. So it should be a, it should be a very interesting event. Uh, yeah, well, I, look- wish I'd, I wish I'd asked for a fee, to be perfectly honest. I didn't know how many people were coming. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think there's some interest from um, from Sydney siders uh, for something similar. So you, you might I'd have, be happy to uh, do it. Yeah. yeah, you might have a request for a, a similar event in Sydney. Well, look, uh, I look forward to the day, gents, where we can all enjoy uh, a cold beer or two uh, when uh, when we're, there's a lot more uh, yeah, news to report on this topic towards confirmation, as Bryce puts it. But uh, I really appreciate all the time you give me today, and uh, and and look forward to continuing. Uh, and our engagement in the months and years to come. So, so thanks again for all your time. Thank you, guys. Thank all you. the best. Bye for now. If you have enjoyed this episode of the Unexplained Rundown, please consider giving it a thumbs up, sharing with your friends, family, colleagues, and social network, as well as subscribing to the channel. And if you'd like to be notified whenever the Unexplained Rundown goes live, premieres or posts a new video, be sure to ring that cowbell.